It's time to talk cars, have a little fun, serious talk, and a ton of passion with Steve, Felicia, and the rest of the gang here on Drive Friendly. And welcome to another episode of Drive Friendly. I'm your host, not a ghost. Steve Roseanne. Happy Steve Halloween, Friendly, everybody. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Happy Halloween. Yes, it's Halloween. I don't know what that means to anybody. Are they going to be trick or treaters? It means there's going to be candy flowing everywhere. I think it we means- should just have a candy toss. Have the kids open up the bag and like we gamble on how far and we can reach and get it into the bag for them. You know, no, I think that's fair. I'm going to be sitting out front drinking beer and having chili. And so, and the kids will, uh, I don't know. We'll see what well, happens. Well, maybe you could serve it out of a hollowed out pumpkin. Wait, wait. Instead of like having beer pong, you could have Halloween pong and have all the kids line up. And mm. as kids get candy, they just go away. But the kid who stays the longest, like gets the most candy gets or something. Gets to drink. I don't know. He has to It'll drink. be fun. So anyway, you're here at 1580 The Fanatic. I'm Steve Rosansky, the owner of Friendly Auto Centers in Mesa. And last week we were talking about saving money on insurance. Today we're going to talk a little bit on saving money at the pumps and saving money on um some basic tire and wheel care we're going to talk about that today it's but all first, about saving saving money. money today but first i want to talk about my jets last week um anybody who listens to 1580 the fanatic ultimate sports radio here knows the jets lost once again last week wait right? how many yards matt i'll ask you this question because steve okay. you know the answer how many yards did the jets make combined total in the second half of last week's game okay i'll so give you a hint i'll give you a hint you can figure it out on the fingers of one hand. Wow. <laughs> four yards. Bottom line four is yards they, did not, they did not move the ball. We understand that. Uh, That's not, no, no, no. Four, four. yards. At four the yards. yards. They moved. They looked Next like, week, we're hoping for five. It, it's, it's Small little incremental improvements. Yeah, the beginning of the game looks like they woke up from their long nap, but um, it went nowhere. And this week, oh they, my played, God. they played Kansas City at Kansas City. The return of Le'Veon Bell, who's going to show the Jets um, – you know, what, what they just gave, literally gave away. So my, my call is that they're going to double team Le'Veon Bell, leaving the throwing routes open all morning. So, so, as, so start yeah, Tyreek Hill in fantasy football is what you're saying. Pretty Perfect. much. And, and then when the Jets say, okay, they're not giving the ball to Le'Veon, then he'll run for 200 yards and five touchdowns. I would take um, Kansas I, City minus 30 today. I would uh, say Sunday. that if I was a Jets player, I would pray to be on the injured reserve list I'd start for drinking. Sunday. I'd start drinking now. I, I would. <laughs> yeah, no chance. Maybe we should. No chance. So we will officially be in a non-winning season uh, as of Sunday because okay. we're zero seven. On Sunday, we'll be zero and eight. Mm-hmm. So the best we could hope for is an even season. We know that's not going to happen. Right. So let's so, hear for the first round draft pick. There we go. And he could quit also. He'll pull an Eli Manning. So anyway, we're going to talk about gas saving tips. But I want to touch on one thing first. Last week, we were talking about um, roadside assistance and stuff that you get with insurance and AAA. So one of my dear friends calls me up last night. He's on his way back from Payson, and his transmission went. So he said, what do I do? I said, well, you know, it's going to start getting dark out. Either get a hotel or, you know, you're going to have to call AAA. I don't have AAA. I said, all right, call your insurance company. Oh, yeah, I have towing on my insurance company. Well, he only has $100 worth of towing on his insurance, meaning an average tow just to pick up the, the vehicle and tow it one mile is usually about $75. So, and then it's like $5 a mile after that. So his insurance company only covers $100. So it cost him like $360 to get back to get towed back from Sunflower to Mesa last night. Now, if he had had AAA, where um, you get up to a certain amount free, but uh, as you increase your membership, like we have a black membership, and we get up to we have unlimited towing, and and that comes with after you remember for a while, like two three years, you can up your membership for longer towing, which I definitely recommend. Or if he had had State Farm, State Farm, or other other ones that may cost a little more, um, or for you more miles, maybe a hundred miles or 50 miles or whatever, but a hundred dollars only gets you about five or six miles. When you're in the mountains of Arizona here, you could, I mean, sunflower, there's nothing there. You have Wico Pa and then you have Mesa. There's nothing. Of you know what? Hills. I, I can't stress how, how important this is, especially now, you know, people with everything going on and people are traveling, but they're traveling in their cars. 
more and more people are traveling in their cars and they're going greater distances. A lot of people are going camping or especially Thanksgiving. I know some people don't want to fly. They're going to be driving more. You, this is really important because if you don't have towing service set up, you are going to be the last in line, especially if it's a weekend or a holiday. And I don't know what you guys have been doing on the weekends, but on the weekends, when we try to go up north a little bit, there's like bumper to bumper traffic. Every so weekend. everybody's traveling. I know you're all out there going somewhere. And no matter how hard you try and no matter how great you maintain your car, and no matter even if you have the world's greatest mechanic at friendly auto centers, things happen. Things, yes. uh, that's what, that's, you know, things, what do you always say? Things work until they break. They work till they break. And sometimes the breakage is unavoidable. You don't see it coming and nobody wants to get stuck. Like if you're going out to California to get stuck on the eight or the 10, oh, yeah, there's nothing, <laughs> there's there's nothing, nothing out there. there. That's right. But if you have AAA or a good insurance company that provides road service, that's either unlimited or more than a hundred dollars worth, you will uh, have better protection. That little bit doesn't cost that much. So let's get down to uh, gas saving tips. So um, Felicia put together a list of questions she's going to throw at me. I have no idea what they are. <laughs> and she's going to ask me what this has to do with. These are just uh, the things that I've heard over the years. You're explaining to people and you're like, I don't know why I keep having to explain this. Well, because every person is new and not everybody lives is lucky enough so to she's live with try, like I am. She's good. Basically, okay. she's trying to. Steve. They don't listen to me. So go okay, ahead. Go I'm gonna, it. It's not a stump. It's more like just get it out for once and for all. all get right. it out. Be done with it. No, <laughs> I don't have to hear it anymore. Be done what with it. What is the deal with air filters? Of air filter. An air filter. It's simple. An engine runs on 15 parts of air to one part of fuel for perfect combustion. Real simple. I've said this a million times. If your air filter is clogged, the engine has to work harder to get that air in to get complete combustion. Or it may not work that harder and I'll just be inefficient. A clogged air filter can lose a mile or two per gallon, depending how dirty it is. An air filter is a very, very simple thing. Most people can do it yourself. If you have a screwdriver, it's kind of handy. And basically, you take it up and hold it up to a light. If you can't see the light through it, it's really, really clogged. But just hold it up to the light. If it looks like not a lot of light is passing, then not a lot of air is passing okay. through there Let's either. Let's pretend I didn't go to mechanic school and say, um, where is the air filter? It's under the hood. Usually there's a box that says air filter on it or a big tube go into the intake. You could look in your owner's manual, you know, that thing that's still wrapped in plastic in your car, or you can Google it or you, I mean, YouTube it. I mean, these are very, very simple things. Average air filter is 10 to $20 at any auto parts store. You come to Friendly Auto, we do it. We don't charge labor. We just charge the same. And how, and how often should you check your air filter? filter? We check them at every oil change because especially in the summer where it's a lot of dust, they get, they get clogged. There's no mileage interval that you replace them when they're dirty. And while you're doing that air filter, check the cabin air filter, which is behind your glove box. Another simple do-it-yourself thing. You take the glove box. There's these little tabs. Open the glove box. Slide the filter out. If it's filled with leaves and stuff, throw it out. Clean it out. Put it back in because that's the air you breathe. If I don't want to buy air filters at a store, can I buy them online? Yeah, you can. You can go to... Uh, uh, you know, I'm sure you can buy them on, on online. I'm sure our local business owners will really appreciate that you're going to Amazon to buy an air filter instead of a local auto parts store like Factory Motor Parts. But yeah, save one dollar. Okay, so I'm not going to be doing that. Yeah. That was what about what okay. about when you get an oil change and someone comes in and the the mechanic comes in and says, "Well, look at this filter. What is that? Is that an oil filter? Is that an air filter?" Usually, it's an air filter. And here's the other thing: if he charges you labor to change that air filter, run away from that guy because if He'll take your new. He'll take your old one out to sell you one, and then if you buy one, he'll charge you for the filter and he'll charge you labor. But if you don't do it, he'll put the old one back in for free, which makes no sense. We found a shop charging like thirty dollars labor to put an air filter in. What's the difference if you put the guy's old one back in or the new one in? Why? Why do people have to be that way? I never understood that. All right. So enough okay. about air filters. So <laughs> thank you. I guess I'm being dismissed <laughs> on air filters. That's all there is to say about air filters. You just save money, though. You think about that. If someone gives you an invoice, you're like, no, absolutely not. Well, yeah. would, would air filters help now, especially with trying to keep your, d does it make a difference if you're keeping your car sanitized when you're talking about cabin air filters? On the cabin would air filter, yes, difference? you definitely, that, that makes a difference uh, for the cabin because that is the air you breathe. Um, with COVID, not really, but um, you're getting a lot of pollen, you get a lot of outside air. What we do at Friendly Auto, and you could do also, um, we get that Febreze allergen and we spray it on the cabin air filter before we put it back in. And I don't know, I, I believe it does help kill something within the system. Um, or you could just spray Fabrice allergen or some of the other 
sanitizing things right down into the ductwork if you're really concerned with germs and everything. But changing that cabin air filter is easy. It's cheap. Uh, they make upgraded ones that have carbon fill, carbon filled stuff or even cleaner air. Can so, they make ones that smells like apple pie? Uh, well, it's like Thanksgiving. You know, it's Halloween, but Thanksgiving pie? is right around the corner. Pumpkin pie, apple pie. Apple pie air so, filters. Speaking yeah. of Halloween and th speaking of traveling and Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and all this stuff, what is the big deal about whether or not there's stuff in my trunk? I mean, I know you say you don't want any junk in my trunk, and that's a conversation yeah. for another time. That's a different show. But <laughs> well, uh, what difference does it make to you if I have a lot of, you know, maybe I need necessity things in my car? What difference does it make? Because we, we first of all, when when you put all that weight in the trunk of a car, excuse me, in all that weight <laughs> in the trunk of a car, it it it's like carrying extra people, and and what it does is if it takes the car much more work to move the car plus the weight in the trunk you're wasting gas we had a woman i won't mention who it wasn't me who i noticed the back of the car was <laughs> sagging maybe it was so me. i am i opened up the trunk it was a nissan maxima i took out about 300 pounds of books and crap okay, that out me. of the back the car came up an inch and a half in the back and four miles to the gallon difference she comes home the next day she goes Wow, you did a great job tuning my car up. It's so peppy now. It's like it, the trunk was filled with crap. And it wasn't the crap. Other thing, they were books. I was teaching at the, the time. Point I is, the point is, when you have a trunk filled with stuff, the other thing you can check is your spare tire because you're going to go, ah, it's fine. I'm not moving all this stuff until you get a flat. Oh, my God. Find we just saw that. We just saw that on the side of the road last weekend. We were driving by, and this poor family was put on the side of the road. And what, their spare we wa tire, they, we, we watched. We saw them get a flat, but we we... As as we watched, he opens up the trunk and pulls out a shredded tire out of his trunk. His spare oh. was garbage. So now they're on the side of the road and they have nothing. I can't tell you how many people have bought used cars, never checked the spare, and then they go to have a flat. Either the spare is missing, it's flat, it's the wrong one. That's another good thing. When you buy a used car and there's a spare tire, make sure that's the right spare for the car. I can't tell you how many times you a year we me. get those. I could tell you anything. But yes, get rid of the junk in the trunk and your car, you'll, you'll save gas, you'll save wear and tear on the car also. Come on, hit me. You mentioned, you mentioned this before about uh, campers and RVs and so many people that are now camping even more. Uh, you, I don't know, a number of shows ago, you said, hey, if you've got a, a lot of times these travel trailers don't come with spare tires. Mm -hmm. So that night when you said it last time, and I think it bears to say again, I went home and looked under my campers, holy cow. There's no spare tire. So I had to go to a local tire place and get a spare that I now take with me. If my tire would have blown before yeah, I bought that spare, before you mentioned day. it, I would have been in that situation on the side of the road. So, yeah, just another friendly reminder. On That's it. right. And sometimes um, the tow truck drivers don't have those kind of spares or can't fix them for you. Their their job is to only fix, you know, put on your spare tire. They can't tow an RV with a flat tire. So, yeah. In fact, if you're going, if you have like a tandem trailer with four tires, I would take two spares with you. Okay. And you can get a guy to fabricate a spare tire holder if there's nothing. But, um, yeah, you should do that. We're going to talk about Steve's favorite topic, gas. Now I giving, yeah. it, giving it, getting it, having it, yes. all of it. Nothing like a little flatulence to yes, spice man. up the conversation. Okay, so I want to talk about additives. What's the deal with additives? I have seen you over the years tell these guys, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, just do this, just do this. And you're very passionate. Unfortunately, it's about gas additives. Mm -hmm. But could you explain your passion? Well, I, I'd like to understand it. You know, in a layman's term, it's called gas additives. Us professionals call it fuel supplements. Okay. A little different technology. Cars these days, cars these days don't have gas filters anymore. Okay. There's no gas filter in the car. So you're getting from the tanker truck into the ground, through the pump, out the hose, into your car. There's no filtration. So you have very, very tiny fuel injectors that have to have a very nice spray. Imagine a garden nozzle when you just turn it on and you have that nice, fine mist cone spray. That's what an injector should look like. Unfortunately, due to dirt, carbon buildup, things like that, the fuel injectors start to spray like on full force and it can overwhelm the cylinder, causing misfires, rough idles, all kinds of things like that. So by using a good gasoline supplement, a fuel supplement, well, I'm, I'm ruining myself here, um, <laughs> these things will prevent the formation of carbon at the tip of the injector, and it also help flush out 
uh, any dirt that's in the injector. And if you've ever changed a set of injectors on a car, it's very expensive. And 99% of the times they fail due to clogging. Very few of them fail um, electronically. So if you uh, use a supplement once in a while, um, it will help. I recommend Justice Brothers. Justice Brothers, I've been using them for over 30 years. I have repaired cars with these supplements, um, and they work. There are a bunch out there. A lot of people use Lucas in that little. It, just, it sounds so suspicious. It sounds like voodoo oil or something. It just it doesn't. You know, some, it doesn't sound like it's a real thing. I know, and and in the owner's manual, it tells you don't use fuel supplements or anything like that. But they also tell you to change your oil every ten thousand miles. I don't believe the half the owner's manuals, but by using these and and other additives that they sell. I've had engines last two, 300,000 miles, transmissions last for years, but we're talking about fuel. Having a clean fuel system will increase your gas mileage or keep it optimum. You don't want to have a uh, dirty fuel injector because it just wastes gas, and it's your money. You're working for it. Um, there are some out on the market. I mean, you go to any auto parts store, there's a gaggle of different ones. Now, um, Justice Brothers has been on the show, probably time to get him back on. And we brought a whole bunch from the parts store, and there was one. It's called Lucas. It's in this cool little bottle. We poured it into a dish and used a propane torch. All it does is smoke. This stuff is not even flammable, and yet it's a gasoline additive. I don't understand it. I have had luck with Justice Brothers. I've had luck with Marvel Mystery Oil. I have had luck with BG, which is another competitor of Justice Brothers. They're both very similar. Those are the only ones I use, and most of them you cannot buy at an auto parts store. They usually only uh, the professionals get them. They're a little more expensive. You know, you buy a bottle of Justice Brothers, it's 20 bucks. You buy a bottle of some cheap crap at the auto parts store, it's $5, but one works and one does absolutely nothing. So I do believe in them, but use a good quality one, look for reviews. Um, you know, you spend $20 two or three times a year, you're adding up major savings because you'll never have to replace your injectors, you're going to reduce carbon buildup, and you're going to save gas money. So the investment is basically going to pay for itself in longevity of your engine and without any kind of well, fuel problems. So if you can't get it at, except <coughs> by a professional, so then can you buy it and do it yourself? Or do you have oh, to yeah. have a professional do it? No, you can buy it. If you could find it, sometimes you can buy it on Amazon, which you know I hate doing it that way. But, uh, I mean, we sell it. There's a bunch of uh, CarQuest stores sells. Unfortunately, Factory Motor Parts doesn't sell that um, that stuff, but they do offer another one that that's very very good. Um, I can't remember the name of it. I probably just heard the commercial for it a minute ago, but it is a very good uh, additive as well. Uh, but I, like I said, the other one is one of my favorites. And by using it, you keep everything clean. All right, so come on, give me more. No, me more. I'm Hold just. On. I want to. I want to touch on that one still. So. Go ahead. If I buy a bottle of that, then do I pour a little bit in every time I fill up my gas tank, or how does that work? You pour a whole can in. On the on the bottle, it usually says, you know, one can to 20 to 25 gallons. Now, what you don't want to do, some people say, oh, I'll only add it to half a tank, and it'll double concentrate it. That's wrong. It'll just burn through it faster. You need to have the barbecue uh, approach, low and slow. So let the, let let it do its job. Don't put it in on a quarter of a tank and think you're just going to blast it with detergent and it's going to clean it out. It doesn't work that way. Okay. Old fashioned question. Go ahead. Okay. I'm ready. And do cars even, I like, I don't know that much about cars clearly, <laughs> but <laughs> does anybody get a tune up anymore? Is that like even a thing? Actually the word tune up used to exist for, Hey Steve, I need a tune up means, you know, we're going to change the plugs, put new filters in adjust the carburetor, adjust the timing, things like that. There's there's no adjustments anymore. There's no screwdriver. There's no anything. So the term tune-up is long over. It doesn't exist anymore. When somebody comes to me now and says, I need a tune-up, I ask, are you having a problem? And now, no, I just need a tune-up. And I have to like pull teeth. Well, why do you think you need a tune-up? Well, my check engine light's on and, and I'm getting crappy gas mileage you don't need a tune-up you need a diagnosis because i could do what you can you know what do you consider a tune-up a set of spark plugs well spark do you think plugs. that comes mostly from your customers that are like a, a our age and older yes and maybe yes. The younger, younger people don't, don't know need, the word tune-up because right. it didn't exist like dial-up exactly <laughs> Rotary or, phone. A, or aol <laughs> and earthlink yeah we still have customers <laughs> with that i think i have the one customer that's holding on to juno <laughs> so um the word tune-up nowadays you know spark plugs back then used to last twelve thousand miles i remember the first car when they were lasting 15 and twenty thousand. 
Now spark plugs go for 100,000 miles and even further. I think on my truck, I have 150. I haven't even changed them yet. Um, so usually when they use the word tune-up, it means they're experiencing a problem and then a diagnosis is what's needed. But tune-up, no, th that word should be stricken from the vocabulary. So if someone says a tune-up, it's almost like it's almost like a little voice goes off in your head. Okay, they're over 50 and something's wrong with their car. Exactly. And, you know, they, they think it's a tune-up because it may have exhibited a, a similar s symptom that they've had before where a tune-up cleared it up. But there's so many more... Um, components to a car than than there was years ago that um, it, it's impossible to just open up the hood and say oh you need a mass airflow sensor you have to do proper testing it saves money and it saves time don't just throw parts at a car okay I'm gonna have so, to I'm gonna have to tell Ryan to stop uh, using that he's like yeah I'll give her a tune up <laughs> I know you're the maven of mortgages but come on bro I don't first of all I think that's been a long time since Ryan said that and Ryan is buried <laughs> Ryan sends his apologies he is buried up to his very not haired head um and in refinancing today he's got like six closings the today guy's four foot eight how between much refinancing so i mean we'll get to the housing market in a little while and tell you how like there's less than a month's worth of inventory out there okay so that's 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 where ryan is right now but here's another question for you and i don't understand why this makes a difference Go ahead. i'm but ready <clears throat> wheel alignments ah. like why would wheel alignment make any difference i mean i understand how it could help how your car would would like handle, but what has it got to do with gas mileage? Like, you know, I, at all? I love this, this question, and I know you, you you brought this from an from an old episode at our old station. I haven't talked about it in a while. The two biggest things that cause gas mileage, in my opinion, is tire pressure and wheel alignment. Have you ever tried to drive your bicycle when the tires are low on air? How much more effort did you have to push to get that bicycle to move? It's the yeah. same thing with a car. If your tires are underinflated, and this week everybody's TPMS light is on because the temperature dropped like 40 degrees in the last five days. So everybody's been coming oh, and carrying a tire. What so. week did the temperature drop? Whatever, September, uh, October. What, what, what I was a month behind. What week is this? It's the last week of October. And when did so I say you, the weather was going to change? The last week of October. Here's a quarter. You're right. Okay. I just need to <laughs> say publicly because every year we have yes, the same argument. my wife was he right. He says September. I say it's like wishful thinking. Guys, it's just easy to give in. So, oh. So low tire pressure will cause, um, and I just explained that, you know, it's like with a bicycle. Now, with your wheel alignment, imagine this, four wheels running perfectly straight down the road, no resistance. But what if the alignment was off a little bit? And we're going to call it toe in and toe out. Those are the most common adjustments that you need on a wheel alignment. So stand straight with your feet and point your toes out on both feet to the outside. Well, okay. if you're driving now, just imagine this. Right. That is called toe out. So now the inner edge of both front tires are actually facing, they're pointing out, but the inner edge is actually the most forward part of the tire. So it's going to wear on the inside of the tire. But when it's doing that, it's actually dragging. You're at, that's why the tire is wearing, because you're dragging that tire. You're creating friction. And that's what's pulling the rubber off the tire. So if your car is out of alignment, you're talking anywhere from one to five miles per gallon, depending on how off it is. And that's just with tow. Camber and cast are, are two different measurements, but they won't affect uh, gas mileage as much as tow. Tow is the only thing that offers that resistance. Now, if you um, point your toes facing each other, now the wheels are towed in. That puts the leading edge of the tire on the outside and you're going to be wearing tires on the outside. Most people think it's camber, which is the top of the tire, in or out. This is the front of the tire, in or out. If your car is out of alignment and the toe is bad, some symptoms are, again, poor gas mileage. But when you're going around turns, you get a squealing tire because you're turning and one wheel is really catching the inside, the other one not so much. So it'll be the opposite side that's going to squeal. So go in for alignment. I think you should do it once a year. and even if you see a little bit of tire wear, you want to take that and get it taken care of right away because rotating the tires, all you're going to do is just wear out the ones that you just moved to the front. But it's not like the rubber is going to grow back on there. You know, a lot of people come in, I'll just, we'll just rotate them across them, but you still have to align it. And if you wait too long, you just ruin the set of very expensive tires. So wheel alignment is um, 
you know, uh, of course, it has a lot to do with handling and wheel alignment is very, very crucial. Now you're going to be seeing it more important, especially with ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. We're going to talk about that on another show, how that and wheel alignment, the whole geometry of the vehicle is going to be more important than you've ever seen in your life. It's going to be part of the, the whole safety of your vehicle. But yes, gas mileage, wheel alignment definitely has um, those things in common. So when you're, when you're aligning your wheels, are you supposed to do a balancing and like a rotating or you're not? Now I'm, I'm well, really confused. Balancing is you do that off the car. Balancing is making sure the tire itself is balanced to the wheel. Because every tire, when they're built, has a heavy spot in it. By putting it on a balancer, the, ba the balancer will determine where the heavy spot is and by how many ounces and put place the weight exactly opposite where that belongs. So if your weight is at eight o'clock, now you know your heavy spot is right across. Um, some better tires only need a little bit of weight. Some cheaper tires, you'll see them pounding three or four ounces on there. But an alignment will not cause a shimmy. Okay, very, very important. A lot of people say they, they're having a shimmy in the car, I need an alignment. Alignment will not cause a shimmy. A balance will cause a shimmy. A bad tire will cause a shimmy. Um, so let me ask you a question, though, because if suppose somebody comes in with a truck and you see they have like a little a hitch on the back, mm -hmm. and then you find out that they're going to be dragging their camper, does that change how you deal with their tires? Actually, that's a really good question. Um, when you shift the weight on a vehicle, let's say you're towing a camper. Matt has a, a pickup truck. When that camper is on the back of it and if he doesn't have the right suspension in the rear so let's say the back sags a little bit well the front is going to come up a little bit and the tires are going to kind of go out on camber a little bit so if you don't have the the better suspension in the rear to keep the truck level what we've asked people to do is put ballast in the pickup bed you know throw you know five you know maybe a couple of hundred pounds of uh, weight in the back to simulate what the weight of that trailer is, the tongue weight. Mm -hmm. And this way we can align it properly or as best as we can with that. But the best suggestion is if you're camping, have the rear suspension, either an adjustable or heavier duty springs, so it stays level. If you are if you have too much weight on there, it'll change the handling characteristics. So like, like you would with a doctor, if you're going to your mechanic, you need to tell them really what you're going to use that vehicle for. Don't lie to us. We're going to find out. It's not a matter of lying. <laughs> it's a matter of just like not fully disclosing, like, oh, I didn't mm -hmm. think about it. Like yeah. I didn't realize that my pickup truck that I drive around town all week long is going to be hauling like a camper every weekend. Yeah. And that's going to change what you need to do for it. Absolutely. And it has to do, uh, again, with uh, shock absorbers, tires. I can't tell you how many people buy, uh, you know, they'll buy a brand new pickup truck, uh, you know, like an F-150, and then they want to tow a 30-foot trailer with it, and they didn't optimize their vehicle. They, you know, the transmission runs about 100 degrees hotter when it's pulling weight. You have to put an additional cooler in. The shock absorbers may be just for a pickup truck. Maybe you need some better shock absorbers, stronger ones. Maybe the trailer hitch you have isn't the right one. Maybe you need the one with the stabilizer or an anti-sway thing. Um, there, I mean, there's many, many things you need to do when you buy a truck to consider for camping or towing usage because it, everything affects everything else. Hey, yeah. what, what about the, the tires? Could you increase the PSI in the back tires? To no, you, 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 that's not really going to help. The tire... You have to get a tire that's rated for the weight. Just increasing the air in the tire is not going to help you because as the tire gets hotter, the air, it's going to expand. You can end up having a blowout, and that's the wrong way to do it. You need to get a stronger, like a 10-ply load-range E-tire um, if you're going to be carrying weight. You can't use a regular passenger tire, uh, and that's a big mistake. You want something nice and strong, but the pressure, no. The pressure has to be what the pressure is on the placard uh, inside your door jam. And joining us finally is the most frightening woman in the East Valley is PK Jordan from East Valley Mediator. Welcome to the show. She was a little late today. She's still getting over the depressing Chicago Bears loss on Monday Night Football. So, yeah, you know what? I think we needed a mediator on Monday night because my husband <laughs> wasn't happy at all. So. Yeah, sorry about that. Look, welcome to the Loserville. You know, but they're still good. They're still on top. You know, what are they, five and two now? So yeah. they're still doing good. And tonight we're recording this on Thursday. 
And um, we have a dull game tonight. The, it might not be. Sometimes those the, mediocre teams play. When two mediocre teams play each other, it could be really fun. The Falcons against Carolina. I'm going to call Carolina's going to win this one. T- Teddy In Bridgewater, the last two minutes. Teddy Bridgewater is <laughs> going to pull out another In the last game. two minutes. Because something, the Falcons apparently only think a football game is 58 minutes long. I don't know. I don't get it. Well, let's just, with that being said, let's take a quick minute to focus on the last minute and four seconds of the Falcons loss last week. <laughs> to, oh, your, to the Lions. The, the one and only Detroit Lions. There you it's go. It's beautiful. Yes. And, and uh, let's talk about the NFC East for a minute where the first place team is two and five. <laughs> this is a great season. I got to tell you. All right, Felicia, take it away. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's the only thing I can hold on to because as a Jets fan, we all know where that's going. I hate the Giants. I've always hated the Giants and I'm not particularly fond of the entire NFC East. So watching them be in the toilet where they so rightly deserve while I live in the a- and the NFC West where the teams are killing it. Oh, killing yeah, it. It's so exciting. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, oh my God. Oh, my God. The Arizona Cardinals made the front page of the the New New York York Times Times. Sports Edition all the way in New York because that's how hot the Cardinals are playing. And we have no teams in New York besides Buffalo, which I'm sorry, my friends who live in Buffalo, but it's really not part of New York. It's really South Canada. I don't care what you say. Anything north of the Bronx is Canada. (laughs) Yeah, it's absolutely. I wanted to say something before you got carried away. You know, it is tire pressure time. I just got 500 uh, friendly auto tire gauges in. Any of you guys who want to come down and grab one for free, and we'll check your tires, give you a free tire gauge, just come on down anytime, and uh, we'll be happy to give it to you. I forgot about that. Because Uh, we all know how important air pressure is in your tires. That's right. Saves gas. So, PK, you were saying during the break, that Matt was saying something that really came in handy for you. Exactly. So the interview that was going on last week about the life insurance and then, you know, spouses, you know, um, not wanting the the next spouse to get the money and whatever, that is, it came at a perfect time. I've got two clients right now that we're having that conversation as we speak. So it was perfect, perfect timing. Love it. The more, the more, you know, the more you're prepared to go into a negotiation, the more you the more you understand, a lot of people, I find I find this a lot as a realtor when I'm dealing with people, and we're going to talk about this with Ryan. Hopefully next week we'll have a big um, episode about like how to get a loan and what to do to get a loan. But people, you know, I don't think it's as much negligence as it is just ignorance. People just don't know. They don't even know what they don't know about their own lives. They don't even know what they don't know about their insurance or their life insurance. Or do you have disability? Is it, from, is it short-term or long-term? Is it coming from your business? People just don't know. They're so busy. Life is so busy that you know they just sign the dotted line and whatever, and they don't know everything that they even own. And they, I, I had one guy, he ended up not being able to qualify for a house because he forgot that he co-signed for his daughter's student loan and she'd gone into default two years ago. They hadn't been speaking. He was like, well, I don't even talk to her anymore. I was like, dude, it doesn't matter. You signed. So it, it's just, it's really funny how you think everyone thinks that they know themselves so well, but there's... There's a lot that they miss. So I just want to finish up. I'm going to finish up today. Then we'll go back and finish and wrap up. But we've been talking the past couple of weeks about the fact that the market is so super hot. People are buying houses. I mean, my, my partner, Michelle, and I just took, we closed on two offers this week. So people are buying houses. I know Ryan is doing six closings today as we speak. So stuff's happening. But who's getting the house? The people who are getting the houses are the people that are really the most aggressive, and the most well prepared to put their offer out because when you have it is less than what I think I read that we are ninety five percent up for houses listed less than five days from where we were a year ago. So there are houses, most houses, if they're priced right, they're not staying on the market. We have less than a month's worth of inventory in the in the valley. So if you want a house and it's time for you to buy, you just have to be really prepared. And we talked about a lot of things. We talked about being ready, making sure you have enough money for your down payment and your closing costs, having an inspector lined up. These are all important things, knowing what your real wants are. But there's a few other things that you could do to make it a lot easier and save yourself a lot of time and heartache. The biggest reason people rush into buying a house is fatigue. They're tired of looking. I'll just take this one. It's next one up. I'm just going because I don't want to look anymore. I've wasted five weekends. My realtor is mad at me, which they're usually not, but people feel bad because, you know, they've been looking and looking and looking and nothing's been happening. But there's a way to prevent yourself from finding the next house you see if it's not the right house. And that is to do more previewing and less on the boots viewing. There is no reason in the world that you cannot 
And you don't even need, I mean, I hate to say it, you don't even need your realtor to do this. You can literally Google any address that comes up. If a house comes on the market, your realtor sends you, you know, new houses listed today and it comes up. You go on the listing. You could do this from the listing they send you or you could do it from Google Maps. You go on, you find the address, you do a map satellite search right at the beginning. You go on to satellite and you zoom all the way down into that neighborhood because there's so many times that I will take a client to see a home and they're like, oh, I didn't realize that it was on a corner. I didn't realize that this was by a major road. I didn't realize that there was a power line behind me. All the things that make you not want to buy a home, you can see that on Google Maps. So the minute the listing comes up, if you Google Map it, you look, take a view of that street, you'll be able to see right at the beginning if this is even an option from the outside. You might look at it and say, oh, you know what? There's no HOA, but the guy next door has 16 pickup trucks on his lawn. I don't want to live there. So if you do more of that, and then a lot of these listings also have virtual tours. Where take the time, go through the virtual tour, because then you'll see, oh, no, the master bedroom, it's an older house. It doesn't have a walk-in closet. That's a deal killer for me. Or there's, two, there's three bathrooms, but only two of them have showers. I got five kids. That's a deal killer for me. These are the things that you can see on a virtual tour. And also, understand the areas you're looking in. You know what? Take a drive on the weekend. Take a drive during the week, after, whenever you have time. Drive around the neighborhoods and see how far is, you, you know, I hate, I hate this supermarket. I love, this, I love fries. Fries is 20 miles from me. I don't want to live here. Or maybe you're going to get this amazing house in Apache Junction, and there are amazing houses in Apache Junction, but the supermarket is 20 miles away. That's not going to work for me because I have three young kids. You know, just understand the neighborhoods you're looking at, because if you know that going in, then you'll be able to make a, when you make your fast decision, because decisions do have to be speeded up now, it'll be one that you'll be more comfortable with. It'll be a better decision because you'll go in prepared. So that would be number six is do more previewing and less viewing. So any, anybody like comment that. on that? We listen, we, we went through that when, uh, when we were going for this house. Yes. I mean, we, we, th this particular house that we live in now, I saw this house a hundred times online well, and I fell in love with it. But that was like a year and a half ago when oh, the house know, stayed I online know. a long time, but yeah. I knew the area. Yeah. The point was we knew the area. So when the house, when, when our house finally, you know, when I was able to, to sell my house, when we got under contract for my house and we knew that this house was out there, it was a very fast decision. We literally put, came and visited the house. We already knew the area. We knew what we were looking for. Yeah, so that's really it. important. The next part, the next thing, there's two more to go. The next thing is do not be, do not be afraid to negotiate, even if it says as is. Now, there's a real misunderstanding about how houses are sold in Arizona. People think you can go in and just pick a house and then make all these changes because you want the house a certain way and the seller is going to do that and that's the house you're going to buy. That like never happens especially in a seller's market. That never happens. In fact, legally, houses in Arizona are sold as is. The fact that people make changes between the beginning of the contract and the closing, that is a, gra a graceful thing that people do. That is something that they don't have to do. If you don't want the house as is, you can walk away, but you really are buying the house as is. You can, you can try to negotiate for something better. You can try to negotiate to have the air conditioner fixed or have the roof fixed. And most people do, but understand that's a negotiation. It's not a have to. So when people walk and they get their 10 day inspection, sometimes, and I see this a lot with newer agents, somebody will go in and say, well, I didn't like that there was chips on the wall. I didn't like that there was no grout in the bath. The grout in the bathtub was older. I didn't like the fact that the lighting fixtures were older. There were things about the house that I would like to fix. And they have a list that's 50 items long. That's never going to happen. That's never going to happen for a lot of reasons. First of all, the person selling the house, it was good enough for them. So they're going to be very offended if you want to make 100,000 changes to the house. Then don't buy it. It's usually, that's usually the response I get. When I get, a, when I get a, a, an inspection report that comes back with requests like that, the first thing I say to my client is, we're not going to do all these things, so don't get upset, but I'm going to tell you what they're asking. Their reaction always is, then let them not buy the house. I'll sell it to somebody else. Yeah. So it's realistic to ask for living things that really make a difference in, in the quality of your living. Actual, can I live in this house? Is the air conditioning working? Does the water, does the plumbing work? Is the roof going to fall off? Am I going to electrocute myself if I turn the light on? If any of those things are going to happen, they really should be negotiated and they really should be fixed. But that's it. 
That's it. And especially in this market, and sometimes you're not going to get that. So you have to understand that negotiating is just that. It's not, it's not a guarantee you're going to get it. It's a guarantee that you, that you may get it or you may not get it. And you have to understand that it's really up to the, it's up to the talent of the realtor that you hire to negotiate. And it's up to the will of the people that are selling the home, whether or not they're going to stand firm and how strong their realtor is. Which is why I always say, as a buying agent, I always want to know the motivation of the person selling the house because if they their motivation is, eh, we want to see what we can get and we may or may not sell, we got a good offer, we're going to sell. That's not something that I feel like I can ask a whole lot for because those people are kind of on the fence anyway about really selling. If I know that they're moving, that they're having another baby and they've already got you know filled to the brim, if their mother-in-law is coming in, if something compelling is making them sell, then my, my position is much stronger. I can negotiate much harder. And I also need to know the motivation of the person buying the house if I'm selling. Are they just putting an offer in, but they'll walk away? Or is it they're a contingent and they got to be out of their house and they need a place to go? That's it makes a very, because when we were, when we've been selling the listings that we've been selling, we've actually been selling to contingent offers because it's very compelling. We know these people have nowhere to live. We know that they have no options, that this house is their option. It makes me much better to negotiate, much tougher for my, for my clients. So, yeah, and the number, the, the last one, yeah, you got to know your stuff, man. You got to, you got to ask. And that's the funny thing. When I'm dealing with an agent on the other side, you'd be surprised how much you can learn by just asking. Hey, your client's moving out of town. Did you get him another house? Hey, is this a two-sided deal for you? People will tell you, but you got to ask. They're not going to volunteer. You got to ask. There's wants and needs. And that's the thing like you, what you're really good at doing is that if you know, if you do your homework and, you know, and learn those, those particular details, you're doing your, your job to help them get that house. It's when the agent says, yeah, we can ask for it. And um, we'll just see what they say. You're doing a total disservice to your, that's a weak family. agent, that's not something that you do. Uh, Cause we, we bought some houses yeah. and I know like for me with the pool, that's a very big component and there's wants and needs. That's the bottom line. And I think if people can go in and understanding what the difference is, they will be a lot more successful. But when they start tearing it apart with you know, nitpicking, go get another house or go get a new spec home. Oh, I have literally, well, being from New York. Didn't and, you have and, a house with switch plates they were arguing well, about? Well, listen, I, I've had a couple of clients and <laughs> you have to know who you're working with and you have to have a good, open, honest relationship <laughs> with the client. But there have been a couple of clients that I have yelled at in the middle of a deal. And I've literally said, are you losing your mind? I said, you're, you're completely losing sight of what's at stake here. I mean, I had one woman, I love her. She's up in Peoria, beautiful home, five bedroom. I mean, gorgeous backyard. They were right by Greenway. It was her dream home. She literally said, this is my dream home. Make sure I get it. And during the negotiation, it came out that the gas grill no longer worked and the owner wasn't willing to fix it. He said, you're lucky you're getting it at all. And she almost walked away from the deal for a gas and, oh, for a gas. And I literally had her on the phone. I, I promise you. And I was like, are you mad? Are you crazy? You made me nuts to get this house. We negotiated this for, for a week. We were negotiating for this and you're going to walk away. I said, I'll buy you a gas grill. Just sign a deal. <laughs> we, we sold out and, our house. And P.S. P.S. She has been thanking me every anniversary ever since. She's been calling me and she's going, because I send her a little, it's an anniversary. She's like, I love my house. Never mentions the gas grill again. It's not, it's a non-issue. She probably okay? uses charcoal now. So the, the last one that I want to mention is really, really, really important. Okay. If, if you forget everything else that I've talked about the past few weeks, please listen to this. Do not think your closing date is set in stone yeah. in this market. Do not. Think your closing date is set in stone in this market. Let me say it one more time for the back row. Do not think your closing date is set in stone in this market, which means have a place to live and a place to put your things if you have to move out on Friday, but the closing doesn't happen till Tuesday, even though it was supposed to also happen Friday, because this is happening a lot. And it is, I would love to blame somebody for this. But the <laughs> truth is the market's so hot and there's so much going on. People can only work so fast. Deals can only, you can only close. If you take the same amount of people working and this, uh, you can only, people can only work so hard. You could do 10 closings. You could do 20 closings. You can't do 50 closings a day. You just can't. People can't, 
the, the talent can't record as fast. The banks can't process as fast. The lenders can't process as fast. And those poor title people, they can only work so fast. And I know I have friends in title. They're working till midnight sometimes trying to get all these deals together. The point is, if you know you have a closing, have a place to live for a couple of days or a place to put your things or, or prearrange with your moving company, ask the question, what if we can't pack up on the same day and deliver on the same day? What happens to my stuff? What other charges? And put that money aside. Because in the best case scenario, you're going to have an extra 500 bucks. In the worst case scenario, you will still have the money that you knew you had to have because now you don't have a place to live and you need to get a hotel room for the weekend. It happens a lot. It's been happening a lot out here. Steve could tell you because he has he rents U Hauls and people are like I needed fuel four more days. I needed five more days. We have one living in one right now. The closing didn't happen. And I said, Did you use a bank? He's like, How did you know? I said, Please. Well, yeah, the banks, the banks, through. the banks. Lenders and like Ryan usually they they try to close in thirty days. Sometimes it's thirty two, thirty three, thirty four. Banks. We had one closing. We <laughs> I, they wanted to, they wanted it to be six weeks. I told them that it's never going to happen. That my client and I are going to go somewhere else. They did it in four and a half. That was a miracle. Anyway, we are totally out of time right now. I know. I want to wish everybody a really safe and happy Halloween. Yes. Please and, be and, safe out there. Remember this. Kids running out between cars. Keep it slow. Don't rush through neighborhoods because, you know, kids and parents and dogs and stuff, everybody running around. Be safe. And remember, drive friendly, Arizona. Stick around next Stick around now for some great sports radio here on 1580 The Fanatic and be here next Saturday morning because we'll be back with a special guest next week. We just don't know who it is yet. I don't know who it is. I'm going to tell you later. Okay. Have a great Halloween, everybody. Drive friendly. Thank you for listening to Drive Friendly with Steve and Felicia. Visit drivefriendlyaz.com for live shows, past shows, and more about our host and guests.